Hey, nice to see René again. Uh, René Breton, he was a postdoc with me quite a few years ago. Um, and we had, a, we had, a, we, I think we did lots of fun, nice things, uh, <coughs> in particular in Beijing, where we wrote a paper together with other people in about a week on what was claimed to be a planet hotter than its host star. And of course, that is impossible. So we knew that other people would also think that's impossible. And it is a white dwarf, of course. It had to be something. <laughs> um, but that, that was really a fun paper where we talked about boosting and all, all kinds of things that we derived so sort of from first principles and all within a week. And it's a nice collaboration with people in, uh, in England and Sol Rapport at MIT, which just kept circulating there. The manuscript went with the sun, basically. <laughs> um, Anyway, that was really good. So um, I have very good memories, and it's very nice to see René again. Um, before he came to Toronto, he was a, a PhD student at McGill, working on the double pulsar and eclipses, and sort of the geometry of that, which is needs mostly needs you to really be able to think three dimensionally, um, which is, is not not such a common thing. Um, and while he was in Toronto, we partly started with something that that has become. A, well, as state part of what René is doing, it's certainly part of a much larger thing, which is to model binaries in more detail, of in particular irradiation, with the idea that you can learn something about their geometry, maybe hopefully measure masses. Um, like me, René finds that actually measuring anything of a neutral star is really hard, but they're super good probes. They're always so interesting. So you, you learn things about the companion, about how irradiation works, about binary evolution, about interstellar medium, whatnot. Um, so it's not so bad. They're just a good source. You just should not hope too much that you'll actually solve the equation of state, which you mentioned. Um, so after um, Toronto, and they first moved to Southampton, where he got a faculty position too. I remember that right? Yeah, yes. yeah. started uh, as a postdoc. Started as a postdoc and then got a faculty position there, but um, Southampton lost a lot of people, good people, and <laughs> René and his wife Anna, who you maybe have seen before, they both realized that, that life could be better in Manchester, and so that's where they moved, and they have been since, and he's a professor there now too. Um, and it is a, it's a, it is a nice place. Um, and I mean, so for instance, Tom Marsh was also in Southampton and then went off. So it's, it's, it's really, anyway, uh, you'd hope that Toronto will never be spoken of in these terms. Um, anyway, let's, let's try to make that sure. That's sort of a by the way, but really we're here, of course, to hear about uh, his work, um, in particular on very uh, specific type of uh, pulsars, I mean, spider binary systems, and what we can learn from this, but also a bit about how one can use image analysis for very different things. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much, Martin. Um, sorry if my voice is a bit uh, ropey because uh, I've been suffering from the, the air conditioning and, the, and my daughter passing on a bit of a cold to me. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, it's great to be back here. Um, actually, a lot of my talk today, uh, if I'm speaking about this topic of spider pulsars, it's Martin's fault because he's the one who got me on the, on the track to it and now he's moved on and I basically uh, stuck on that topic for um, quite a large fraction of my research. Although, uh, you know, when you, especially when you get a, you know, a faculty position, then you don't, well, still have to publish, I suppose, but uh, you can kind of do whatever you want instead of being told what to do. And so I tend to be very, uh, excited about a lot of things and started working on lots of stuff, uh, including agriculture. So uh, that's the last part of my talk. Uh, the, this was my research group about five years ago. I think two persons actually were missing. It was like a huge group and four postdocs and uh, an army of students, uh, undergrads and, and postgrads. Uh, so that was a good time. And uh, now my, 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 my funding has uh, shrunk and, and so as a group, uh, but we still do uh, very interesting research, I think. Um, <coughs> so uh, I'll explain what these black widows and red bats and spiders are in a moment, but as a, a bit of a quirky introduction, uh, this is the number of papers published. Uh, if you Google, uh, if you ADS <coughs> black widow or, or red back in the abstract of papers, uh, there were basically a one or two papers a year until about 2008 or so, where it started 
increasing and then like a major boost. And now it's been like, at, uh, what I would call a bit of a steady state since. Um, so this is me, <laughs> uh, sorry, well, on both, but young me, um, uh, brown hair, 2009 is when, but like, well, end of 2008 is where I came here, started working on the topic. And that's me now, a lot older and uh, yeah. Um, so the boost is not me, <laughs> so it's not like I'm claiming I'm the one responsible for that, but I was, Martin and I were there like at the beginning, basically when, when something happened and you'll see what it is in a moment. Um, so Martin's uh, introduction to my talk actually was really good at summarizing basically the kind of outline of my talk. Um, <clears throat> Basically, I quite like using uh, neutron stars to do physics, if that makes sense. Uh, they're interesting on their own, but there's a lot of like really interesting physics to be done. Uh, so Martin mentioned in equation of state, binary evolution, uh, this orbital dynamics, uh, the physics of like how light interacts with the uh, interstellar medium, for instance, uh, and irradiation physics. So that's that, these are topics basically that I'll try to cover. Uh, during my talk. So I'll first like picture what these spiders look like across the spectrum and then I'll take a selection of topics and highlight some of the research that's been done. Uh, but just as a bit of a you know big picture, uh, you know neutron stars, I'm sure you know many of you study them. Uh, they're really interesting objects because they're at the extreme of what we cannot even reach on Earth. Uh, so if you think of in terms of like the the phase space of matter in the universe, uh, temperature and chemical potential, or temperature or velocity and uh, and density, we basically live right there almost. So you have gas, liquid, and uh, and solid, uh, and that's what we're used to. Obviously, there's plasma, right? When you get to higher temperatures, but then you can, um, when you look at neutron stars, they're basically very cold objects uh, by you know this standard of this space space. So neutron stars, they kind of lie there at low temperature or low velocities, if you kinetic velocities for the particles, but really high densities. And you can't reach that on Earth. So if you want to understand how you know particle physics works, uh, they're, they're good objects for, for, for that. Uh, at the other extreme, you have uh, particle accelerators that slam you know, a handful of particles at really high velocities. So that's low chemical potential or densities but really high temperatures and arguably this sort of like on the on the kind of uh diagonal is where it's more actually most difficult to access in nature because you don't really have these more or less like intermediate state where you have a high temperature but also high chemical potential so neutron stars they lie there and they you really um hopefully helping us understand a bit the laws of nature. And even to this day, we don't really understand the full structure of neutron stars. Um, so, you know, the Oppenheimer movie is out, you know, these days. So it's kind of like, um, you know, really interesting for the, you know, the bomb and everything. But obviously Oppenheimer was one of the first to lay down the equation of state of a neutron star, the, uh, you know, the TOV equation of state. And since then, a lot of people have worked on it, but Basically, once you get a bit below the surface, where the, the, the fraction of neutrons increases, then you get in a regime where we don't understand you know, nuclear physics well enough to know what, what state is the matter in. So maybe it's more like classical, where you find protons, neutrons, mostly neutrons, obviously. Uh, or it could be like things like pion condensate, kaon condensates, or other exotic states of matter. But uh, for instance, the uh, you know, the uh, the uh, the uh, symmetry energy of matter at really high density is is something that we don't understand super well. So sometimes I talk to actually one of my nuclear physicists colleague, and he's always querying me about like, oh, have you learned something new about the equation of state? Because you know I, I'm interested, and then I ask back about what he's learned in case you know we could help each other. So. Very briefly, pulsars, uh, that's kind of, you know, the, uh, the, the, the main type of objects that we'll cover for this talk. Uh, we won't you know, get into all the details of what uh, pulsars are, uh, but just to summarize, uh, they're, you know, these rapidly spinning neutron stars. So we're talking about, you know, 15 kilometers or so in radius, uh, one and a half times the mass of the sun. 
And what's really speci special about them is that the, the ones we observe as pulsars have large magnetic fields of say 10 to the 12 Gauss. And because they're so magnetized, um, you have uh, non-thermal emission processes that are prevalent in, in their magnetosphere, uh, which for instance produces radio emission in a very directional way. So you have this beam of light, like a lighthouse that rotates, and then you see a flash of radio light uh, as they spin. So that's for the vast majority of them that we see in the radio. The pulsars have been seen to pulsate pretty much across the electromagnetic spectrum. And then the gamma rays as well, for instance, is, is a, <coughs> a region of the spectrum where the pulsations are really useful. Um, so if you're an optical astronomer and you study like stellar uh, uh, stars, uh, you'll be used to the, the, the color magnitude diagram. So the equivalent for pulsar astronomers is the PP dot diagram where you, you, you display the, the spin period as a function of the, the rate at which they slow down over time. And um, there's a lot of like really cool physics we could discuss, but I'll skip the details. But the reason I'm showing this is uh, because I want to illustrate how different pulsars and binaries are from the regular pulsars. So each dot there is a, is a, a pulsar. The ones in the, uh, just the black dots are the regular isolated pulsars. So we're talking about spin periods between a few tens of milliseconds up down to a couple of seconds. And um, the, uh, we, you can ascribe a, a magnetic field for these objects. So you have constant lines in magnetic fields, so that the kind of average magnetic field is about 10 to the 12 Gauss. Now, the, the one that I want to point out in particular are the ones with a, a circle surrounding them. These are the binaries. And you can see that the binaries you find very few around this big island, and most of them are on the lower left at very, very fast in period, a few milliseconds. But also, for instance, if you look at their magnetic fields, they have much lower magnetic fields of sort of 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 10 Gauss, with that majority. And uh, the reason why they are, uh, they are so different is because of the, the binary evolution process, where uh, the, the more massive star, you know, in the kind of simplest scenario, explodes, forms a pulsar, you have a companion, but then eventually that companion evolves, may go, uh, may turn into a red giant, and then feeds an accretion disk that then transfers angular momentum to the neutron star and makes it spin faster. And through that process, uh, <clears throat> it appears that the magnetic field also reduces. And there, there, there are various theories, but I don't think we're quite settled on exactly how that works. So it's a bit of magic for, uh, still to this day. But basically, you take old pulsars and you can turn them into pulsars that are really fast and energetic. So we call this the, the recycling of pulsars. So the, the companions to pulsars, you can find them with main sequence uh, companions. So they're the ones you typically find there. But once they recycle, basically, the companion end, ends its life. So often you find them with white dwarf companions, in other cases with another neutron star. And in some cases, you find them with like other weird-ish type of stars that are kind of semi-degenerate, like in some cases, brown dwarf looking objects or low, very low mass stars. <coughs> and these are essentially the, the ones that the talk is focusing on today. Uh, uh, and they constitute what we call the spider population. So, um, what are spiders? They are uh, the, the binaries that we find in compact orbits. We're talking about, about uh, 75 minutes to a day. And beyond a day, um, you don't really have a spider anymore. And the main reason is that what makes spiders uh, special is the fact that due to the proximity to the energetic pulsar, so we're talking about spin down the luminosities of 10 to the 34 hertz or, or higher, uh, the companion gets irradiated by the pulsar, uh, potentially by the wind or by gamma ray emission from the, from the pulsar. And so you end up with a star, a low mass star, where, uh, which is tidally locked because of the, of the compact orbit, where <laughs> the, the, the night side of the star is at more or less the temperature you would expect for a star of that mass. So let's say, uh, if it's a 0.3 solar mass, maybe four or 5,000 degrees, but the day side can be much higher temperature. And the, the, the ones 
Uh, so we, we have two subtypes of them. Um, there's the black widows, where the companion is like a, a kind of brown dwarf mass. And then you have the red, the, the red bats, which are more like 0.2 to 0.4 solar mass. And so far, we, it's the main difference between them. Like other properties are very, very similar, unless we get into like the very, very specifics. So, and there seems to be a bit of a gap in the mass. So you could, you could think, oh, maybe it's just a big mass continuum. But there seems to be a bit of a missing you know, population around 0.1 solar mass, like in between those, those two. Uh, so the black widows, for instance, um, they can be as cold as uh, you know, 1,500 or 2,000 degrees, but some of them will have base side temperature of 10,000 degrees. So it's a huge amount of impinging you know, energy on the A side. And connected to that is the fact, as you can see on this little picture, the companion basically evaporates over time, and it could maybe if it evaporates fast enough, it could kind of like melt away entirely. So that's why they got their nicknames of the deadly spiders, because black widows are infamous for potentially you know, devouring the male after they mate. So that's, that's where it came about. Okay, so that's the spiders. Um, right, so across the spectrum now, <clears throat> In, when you look at them in the radio, uh, you, the light is basically dominated by the, the neutron star, which is you know, the pulsar emission. Uh, what you see in the radio is uh, 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 eclipses. In some systems, you can have eclipses that last 70% of the orbit. So very, you know, the, the pulsar might be very, very elusive because it's most of the time not, not there. Uh, and that's the evidence that the companion is evaporating because you, you have material basically that's shed away from the star, the, the, the companion star, litters the surrounding environment, and, and blocks the radio emission. Now, the mechanism for that, the eclipses, uh, uh, remained kind of a bit speculative for a number of years. Now, I think we've converged quite well on what it is. And actually, Chris Thompson published a lovely paper in the mid 90s about like essentially the full array of uh, potential mechanism that could take place. Uh, but these days we, we think it's mostly uh, synchrotron uh, resonance that causes the eclipse. So on this figure, uh, that's the modern version of the eclipse uh, by one of my students, Elliot Poljan. Um, we, we have the, so this is uh, time on this axis and this is pulse cycle on this one. So you can see clearly like a pulsation of the, of the pulsar, but at this phase, 0.25 is when you have the conjunction, when the, pul the, com the pulsar companion passes in front, you know, between us and the, and the pulsar. And you can see this essentially just noise, nothing. And then eventually you see the pulsations appearing and they appear and there's a bit of a, a, a shift in phase, in pulse phase. So that this is due basically to, um, to uh, variations in the, column density of electrons, which causes, for those who are familiar, uh, the dispersion measure, the DM, changes uh, around this period and then stabilizes around the, the, the actual kind of mean value for, for the source. And so this differential change in DM enables us to probe you know, the, the, the ionized medium that's like in the surrounding of the pulsar. And so it's a, it's a bit of a probe of all the messy stuff that's left around. Uh, when you move to uh, the uh, optical, uh, you actually see the light from the companion. The pulsar is very faint. You don't see thermal emission really from it. And uh, most of them don't pulse it very strongly in the optical. You, it's negligible. So what you see is the companion. And the companion, like I described, is, is half hot and half cold. And so uh, you see huge variations in the light of the, the companion, uh, sometimes up to uh, several magnitudes. And uh, you see also color variations as well, because basically you have a, a much brighter object when it's hot, but also when it's hot you, you, uh, versus cold, uh, you have differences in the, in the different filters. And so you can use that basically to try and infer the, uh, the geometry of the system. And that's basically what uh, I, I was set out to do with Martin when I, when I came here. So I'll get back to the details a bit later. Uh, if you go further up in energies, 
when you reach the X-rays, uh, in some cases you might see pulsations from the pulsar, but typically in these systems, the, the dominant um, uh, uh, feature in the X-rays is a, an intra-binary shock, whereby the, uh, the strong pulse of wind uh, with particles traveling at relatively six speed will shock with the, the, the wind and the outgassing material from the companion, which is slower but quite dense, and forms a, a shock front. And um, essentially, uh, there's um, acceleration of particles, and um, the, the, the highest Lorentz factors are produced essentially in the directions of the kind of asymptote to this paraboloid. So when um, our line of sight crosses, basically, these directions, you have a strong enhancement of X-ray uh, uh, emission, and you see essentially a peak. And because you normally come across two, uh, the two sides, the two edges, you see this sort of horn pattern. And what's really interesting is that what we see observation is that the red backs tend to have a wind that dominates the wind of the of the red of the pulsar. And so the, the, the shock actually tends to wrap around the pulsar for the red backs, whereas the wind of the black widows tend to be smaller than that of the pulsar. And so the shock is wrapped this way around. So you can see it clearly in, in the data because 0.5 on this diagram is basically the, the phase as with, at which you have the companion uh, that's, uh, that's behind. So because it's centered around that, means that the shock wraps around the pulsar, whereas for a black widow, it's at uh, half a, an orbit later. Uh, Chris? Yeah, I'm just wondering, what, what's the mechanism making the X-ray emission anisotropic? You were saying that you see a brighter X-ray emission when you're looking down the sheet. Yeah, so um, I would need to check. So Roger Romani is the primary, um, well, Group, you know, his group is the the, the, yeah, the, the main people who, who work on that. And I forgot if their models predict um, different heights, because you know that's observationally, but maybe the so model is mean, just right, symmetrical. You just mean the horns in general. You, know, you mean the horn, or you mean the peaks? Yeah, what, what what is it that's causing the X-ray emitting material to emit in a specific fashion? Is it moving relativistically, or is it? No. So you have the shock. You have well. There's a shock, but also it's mostly like the, the discontinuity, and so you're, the party. Um, so you have like. A, Sorry, I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to just uh, derail your discussion. Yeah. But we can talk about it now. But basically, most when you track uh, like the, the direction of the com like sort of content scattering that takes place, uh, the highest like amount is produced along this way, basically. Um, yeah, but um, yeah. Uh, yeah, and and then if you carry on to the gamma rays, then you have something that looks very similar to what you, we had at the previous slide, except here we're not looking at the folding the photons at the orbital period, but these photons are folded at the spin period of the of the pulsar. So this is pulsations rather than like a feature you see over the orbit. Um, but you also see you also see this sort of horn pattern. Uh, and um, what's basically happening is that, the, well, what we believe these days is that the, the gamma ray emission from pulsars is produced like in the kind of outer magnetosphere in the sort of gap region. And uh, it's quite wide emission, basically, uh, whereas the radio emission is quite a bit narrower. And so, and in the kind of inside the, the emission cone, you have, you know, there is a bit of emission, but most of it is produced like at the edges of the cone. So that's why you have this sort of feature. And then when you drop outside the cone, essentially there's no persistent emission. You know? So the mold, like nearly all of the gamma rays you see from these sources are pulsed gamma rays. Uh, so that, that's the level of the background in, in this particular system. Uh, okay, so what happened uh, is, you know, you remember this plot I showed earlier? is uh, yeah, um, Fermi was launched in the late uh, um, uh, noughties and basically started you know, doing this full sky survey, uh, picked up a lot of point sources all over the place. Some were pulsars we know already, a lot of AGNs and such. 
and uh, the, 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 this, this is more or less still valid, basically. Um, so most of what you see in the gamma ray sky are things like active uh, gal galaxies, uh, but you have uh, a, a non-negligible fraction of pulsars, which are gamma ray sources, some supernovae remnants, also wind nebulae, uh, and then you have like some binary systems. And then you have about a third of the sources, which are just unknown, uh, because uh, the localization of Fermi, uh, you know, tends to be a few art minutes. So if you look off the plane, uh, there could be, you know, thousands of galaxies in that region. So maybe it's a distant AGN, uh, you're not quite sure which one of the galaxies it's connected to, but maybe it's something in our galaxy. Uh, and then when you go on the plane, then things are even more difficult because it's full of stars and binary systems, maybe it's very binaries. But the gamma rays, they're, the optical depth of the galaxy is basically infinite to the gamma rays. So they just, they just you know, travel through. And, <laughs> uh, sorry, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Oh, no, no. Uh, so they just travel through the galaxy uh, without being absorbed. So a lot of the gamma ray sources you see on the plane might be for, um, background you know, galaxies, HENs, but you're just never going to see the counterpart due to the high extinction. Um, so, <laughs> Given that a lot of the sources of pulsar, uh, what people started doing is they started surveying the regions where there are gamma ray sources that are unidentified in the radio to try to find potential new pulsars, which would be either young pulsars that are energetic or uh, you know, these recycled pulsars that are also very energetic. And so this is the, the same PP dot diagram as before. And uh, <clears throat> you can ascribe this how much kinetic energy from the rotation is loss from P and P dot, and they give you lines, diagonal like that, which are constant, um, constant um, spin down luminosities. And so the higher there, the higher the energy. And basically what you see is that what's in black are just the regular pulsars, and what's colored is basically uh, stuff that has been found, like observed with Fermi, either uh, detected by Fermi in the first place, or things that we knew of that Fermi also saw. And what you see is that basically in general, Fermi sees things that are really higher, like high spin down luminosities. Um, so there seems to be uh, a bit of a correlation between like, you know, very energetic pulse, like uh, some con conversion ratio basically of the, the spin down energy that goes to producing the gamma rays. So the more, you know, so if it's a few person basically, uh, then this means that, you know, higher the spin down energy, the brighter it's going to be in X-rays. Uh, so more or less holds true. Now, something that's really interesting is that um, when you look at the gamma ray spectrum, um, pulsars tend to be quite different from AGMs. So on this plot, what we can see, what we call the variability index. So you kind of get your photons and you look how much um, variable they are over time. Like over time, you look at kind of like the RMS of the of the photon, and you look at the spectral curvature basically in the X-rays. You can model with like a parallel or some kind of a you know function that has curvature in it. There's various models, but essentially you know something that's the curve. And the more curved the the gamma ray spectrum is, uh, the more likely it is to be a pulsar. So pulsars are in red, and in blue you have the EGNs. So EGNs tend to be Quite variable, but low, um, you know, quite parallel-like looking in the gamma rays. Whereas the pulsars are quite curved, like a bit like a parabola in the gamma rays, but very little variability. And then you have the unassociated ones, the, the ones we don't know what they are, which are kind of there. So basically, you can kind of try to make cuts in that, this diagram to try to identify the ones that are most likely to be pulsars. And actually, this makes the surveys a lot more efficient. So. <laughs> Various efforts have been done, you know, on all radio telescopes in the past, like GPT and Parks, for instance. But I'll just talk a few minutes about the, the track room survey at Meerkat, uh, because you know Meerkat is still quite new. Actually, there's the five-year conference of Meerkat in uh, this coming February. So Meerkat is a kind of a, an SK precursor. Uh, there are 64 dishes located in the Peru in the in uh, South Africa. And uh, the maximum baseline is about 30 kilometers. And um, 
uh, sorry, eight kilometers, and the, the nearest antennas are about 30 meters, rather. Um, there are three receivers. Actually, the, the slide I prepared before, the newer receiver was ready. So there's the UHF, LBAN, and now the SBAN has been rolled out. Um, I don't think it's on all dishes yet, but some observations at, in, at SBAN have, 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 uh, have taken place, and uh, within the next year, like it's going to be fully operational. Um, so it's the most sensitive telescope in the, in the southern hemisphere. Uh, and so there's this big uh, project called TRACOM, which is the search for transients and pulsars with Meerkat. And uh, there are various subgroups. So I, I lead, along with Colin uh, Clark, my former postdoc, uh, we lead the Fermi counterpart searching. Um, so in essence, we point Meerkat at all these Fermi sources where there's no known pulsar yet. And we try to find new pulsars. Uh, but another, so we do a, what we call a shadow survey. So we, in the first pass of that survey, we looked at 80 sources at um, both LBAN and UHF, and we did two repeats, the two repeat observations in each frequency. And uh, so we found, um, you know, quite a lot of, uh, of new pulsars. Uh, but we also do a targeted survey where we point the telescope at really strong red back candidates that we've identified or others have identified in the in the optical light curves uh, that are also connected to X-ray uh, to gamma ray sources, and we sit on those for one hour at a time, and we do a couple of repeat observations to go very deep because we have a really strong prior to the fact that these should be pulsars. Uh, the nice, so I just want to highlight, you know, one of the sort of novelties of of Meerkat because it's an interferometer with fairly small dishes. The actual you know, field of view of a single dish or the incurrent beam when you, you face the array, but incurrently, is actually quite large. Uh, but the nice thing is that you know, with the, the software correlator, you can then uh, form core and beams, and um, you can either trade off uh, you know, bandwidth or frequency resolution or time resolution for more beams. Uh, but typically, or in our observations, we have an order uh, 500. Uh, you know, tidal beams that we can form uh, at you know some uh, some resolution with typically something like a thousand twenty four soul channels, and uh, the the tiling of these beams uh, we, uh, we we can put fairly compact at about like uh, sort of seventy five to ninety percent overlap in, in total power uh, and cover. Basically, the kind of 95% confidence region of, of the Fermi targets we look at. So we, we can tune it. And so, when the Fermi source is a bit more expanded, we, we tend to spread them out a bit. But we can basically cover in one go the entire region. Uh, so, that's nice. Other telescopes cannot quite do that. They need multiple pointings. Uh, in addition, our, our uh, instantaneous sensitivity is a lot higher. So, for things that are in binaries, you might be able to find, you know, only in the sort of, you know, a five or ten minute chunk of your, say, hour long observation. So it means that you don't need to, uh, um, you know, um, do accelerate. Well, you still need to do it sometimes, but uh, you might not need an acceleration search. You know, you might not need to correct for the acceleration of the pulsar in the binary orbit to find the pulsations. So, uh, so this also improves our sensitivity. So typically, when we detect a pulsar, a bit like those who work here, perhaps with Chime, you know, when you find a, an FRD, usually it shows up in a couple of like surrounding beams. If it shows up everywhere, you pretty much know it's RFI, but if it's only in a couple ones with a certain pattern, you know it's real. So we can use similar techniques to kind of sift through the data. But once we, we've localized one, we usually have a few detections in the beams, and then we can use you know, this sort of technique where we use a, a, a very flux in each of the beam to localize within beams uh, the, the location of the source. And we can achieve this kind of like uh, arc second type of, uh, of resolution when, when we have a good detection. So then this means, for instance, we can then go in the optical and just like tell exactly which star you know, the companion might be, if it's a, spot, if it's a binary, for instance. How many sources do you need? Um, okay, so we, uh, in the first, um, what do we call the shadow survey, so we did 20, 20 minute pointings, uh, 79 sources. We found about um, 
20 new pulsars. So it's about like something like a 20, between 20 and 30 percent. Sorry, sorry, how many oh. radio sources do you find when you target the typical flat error? <clears throat> um, you mean like if you were to look in a radio image? Or? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, exactly. Uh, because you're, you're already presupposing these are pulsars, is that what it is? Yeah, so we picked we pick the, yeah, so we found the period solution, yeah, just from the, just from the spectrum. No, but so usually, I mean, you don't even, I mean, you could look at archival data, or now uh, Meerkat is actually building a, a bit of a full sky survey or a survey of like different regions of the galaxy, so you might have imaging. Uh, so, when, like, we don't do that currently because our, the available imaging is usually not deep enough. Like, uh, because pulsars repeat, right? They pulsate. Usually, you can find pulsars with like you know flux densities of like you know kind of micro Janskys or you know lower. Uh, whereas in an image, you know you don't reach anywhere close to that because the duty cycle of a pulsar is really narrow sometimes. So there are cases where there might be an image or something, and you see a point source, and you know maybe you detect pulsations, but typically that's really not how you go about it. So you just point there and all of our observations are non-imaging. So they're just like uh, time series that we take. So do you then match your solution to the gamma rays? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that, yeah, exactly. So, so there's, no, there's no chance of the contaminant? Uh, well, okay, so you're never entirely sure. Well, you, you can be, but it depends. So once we find a radio pulsar, right, uh, then, uh, the, the, you know, the gamma ray, like, so this is the gamma ray region, and that's like the, the each dot, blue dot there, is one of our tidal ray beam. And these red ones, like, we detected a source which was visible in a couple of these, and then we did the follow up observations where we packed them a lot more to get better localization, and these were the red ones. Uh, but now the gamma ray source, all you know is that, you know, at 95% confidence, it's somewhere here. Right. No, but once you have a timing solution. Yeah, so so that's the first thing, right? So then the, the connection is not 100%, right. uh, but uh, if it's a young energetic pulsar, you know it's, it might be quite likely, but it could still be an AGM. Right. So then what you do is then you, you take the gamma ray photons and then you fold them, yes. right? But then uh, it's quite a laborious job. And I'll, if you can just hold on a bit, I'll, I'll get to that, but yeah, you'll, see, you'll see why. So these are, uh, yeah, so, so far we have, uh, as I think of a couple of days ago, we had 27 discoveries. So about like 20 to 30% of the source, the, the fields we point, we find a new pulsar. Uh, and we have about a dozen new spiders. So basically, uh, these spiders usually, uh, you know, we detect, but out of the four scans we do of that region of the sky, usually we find a pulsar in only one or maybe two of the four observations. So you can see if you have like, you know, a single pass survey, your success rate would be a lot lower. So these are like, this would be the fun portrait. Of some of There's a quick question, how many spiders are known? So, yeah, so uh, about a hundred. Okay. So this is a significant yeah, 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 exactly. So they came from here, right? They came from that or similar searches. Yeah, so uh, when I started working with Martin, there were about five. That's no. And then it just went like uh, like people at Green Bank uh, Parks have found like you know a lot, and with Meerkat we basically now at about like we increase the population by sort of 10, 15 person kind of thing, and uh, we expect we might maybe if we're lucky uh, maybe not double, but sort of yeah. Okay, so I'll cover a few topics, and actually the gamma ray one is is going to come up. Uh, okay, so. Something I was doing with Martin in the early days was by trying to measure the masses. So from the light curve, if you give different temperatures and different orbital inclination, you can change the amplitude of, of what you see, but also like the light in the different filters. The problem is that there are degeneracies with you know things like inclination and temperature. So you need usually a bit more information. If you can get multiple bands, ideally all, all at once with like something like UltraCam, uh, which is a, a three band measure, then you can break a lot of the degeneracies. But then you have also other things like reddening that comes into play, and you don't have dynamical information. So normally, you also need um, 
uh, spectroscopy to get radial velocity measurements. And then you get the mass ratio from that because the pulsar you can time and get the velocity for that one. And then with the light curves, you can get kind of the inclination of the system and you combine it all and you can make a mass measurement. Um, I won't get into all the details, but when we started working on it, we were quite confident and it seemed like the model seemed to work well with the, the original system, 1957. But it turns out that some light curves are asymmetric and there's very systematics. And um, I, I don't really think we can do a lot better than this sort of precision. So it's not like we're going to do tests of GR or things like that with these systems, unfortunately. So, yeah, like Uncle Pete said, would say, uh, with, with great masses come great analysis of systematics. And uh, sadly, yeah, it turns out that when you look in details, things are a, a bit trickier than you would think. So, some a, a really recent result we published is uh, gamma ray eclipses. So, once you fold the photons, which I'll get back to in a moment, um, and then you, uh, you, you add a pulsed uh, flux, but then you look at it folded at the orbital phase. Uh, what you find is that in some in a couple of cases you have eclipses that take place. Um, so we we found that actually in seven uh, systems so far. And so um, you know the gamma rays. I mean they, they, they penetrate quite deep into material, so you pretty much need the physical surface of the companion to screen it. So that gives you like some quite hard constraint on the geometry of the system and. Basically, from that 1957, we know, we, we believe it has to be much more a John than what we had kind of inferred it originally from the Likert modeling. So, sadly, it doesn't seem like a 2.4 solar mass star, but probably slightly below 2 solar mass. Can you remind us where zero orbital phase is with respect to Yeah, so, so 0.25 is the companion coming at the front and the pulsar is, is behind, so the, the, the inferior conjunction. This is the pulsar timing convention. Sadly, people making light curves often have something else. That's yeah. why you switch yeah. in your talk. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, well, uh, I won't get into the details, but I know that Martin has been working on some uh, very nice radio observations where uh, they could basically uh, sort of measure the, the geometry in a different way, and what they find seem to clash a bit with the gamma rays. So. There's a really interesting conundrum of physics going on because, uh, you know, if you believe just the, the sort of um, the, the VLBI, of the, uh, was it VLBI or just VLA. The, the VLA observations of Martin, you might think uh, it's not very edge on and then uh, uh, and the pulsar never gets screened physically by the companion, but then the gamma rays tell you otherwise. So, yeah, so this, when you think you, you saw something, there's basically something else that comes up. Uh, okay, so lately we've done spectroscopy measurements. Um, so, but we instead of just measuring the velocity, you know, we're cross correlating the, uh, uh, the spectrum with a template or something, uh, our code is now capable of generating entire synthetic spectrum for the source. And the nice thing is that because you generate like the spectrum from each surface element of the star, you can generate like this mishmash spectrum where you know half the star is hot and the other star is cold so you have like full consistency self-consistency into like the, the line shapes and their velocity because um you know for instance that the hot side might produce the balmer lines but then you know some like the sodium lines or something might come more like from near the, the terminator so they'll have different velocities if you were to measure them individually so with that we can just do it all at once and have a much better handle of systematics but then it turns out that essentially we think we, build, we, we understand much more the systematics, but then the errors are not necessarily a lot better because now we, we think these are much more credible, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, ideally, so you know, there was a time where the source 1957, we thought it was about 2.4 solar mass, and we don't think it holds anymore, but if it had been the case, it would have been the most massive neutron star known, so it could have ruled out some families of equation of states. Uh, so maybe we'll get lucky eventually and find one of them. So, so where is it now? So it would be right around uh, there. Right. Yeah. Uh, but the other one, the one that's in um, this one is, uh, oh no, sorry, not, uh, 2215 is the one in this band. I think this one will hold actually a bit over to solar mass. We're, we're working on that one right now. 
Uh, yeah, so I'll skip that. Um, okay. So just yeah. real quick, I mean, it's maybe more. 1957, someone had some very weird transitions in the condition. Again, right? So for some reason it's ringing the bell. Uh, it is no changing from making the kilo in the radio, but I don't think that that's, that's probably not what you're thinking of. I think what you're thinking of is this one. So called um, 1023. So oh, yeah, yeah. we, uh, Anne Archibald at McGill found the pulsar in, well, was published in 2009, but in 2006 data, so it was a radio pulsar. But then <coughs> looking in the archivals, that source was already published as a potential cataclysmic variable or some kind of X-ray binary. So in the early 2000s, there, there was spectroscopy and there was a disk in that system. Uh, but then when it was discovered, they did optical follow-up and there was no disk at all. So the, the system had transitioned from being an X-ray binary to being a pulsar uh, binary. So it's like, you know, this really great thing, like the binary evolution everyone was talking about, like is happening. But then people followed up that system longer um, at, at Jodobai, for instance, and, uh, you, and then it disappeared again in 2012. So the pulsar, when it disappeared, it turns out it got brighter in the X-rays and the gamma rays also jump up. So maybe that's what you, you were thinking of. And it got brighter by about a magnitude or two in the optical. And when you look in the optical, now you see like these big emission lines, you know, so it's a clear disk that's reappeared. And so far it's been in that state since, but there's two other sources which have been seen to kind of flip flop like that. And we call them the transitional pol millisecond pulsars. So it seems that, you know, the evolution is not just, you go from here to there, but at least there's a period in the evolution where it sort of goes back and forth before potentially, I, I would imagine, like just settling down to being a, just pulsar. So the dots there, the circles are basically like observations where it was detected and the crosses were non-detections. And so that's the orbit, orbital phase, and that's time. And the, the range between zero and sort of 0.4 or so is the range where you expect the eclipses. So it was never detected. But eventually from a certain point onward, uh, you know, zooming in, and it stopped being detected like everywhere. So people got really excited. Um, <clears throat> so the other thing is when you look at high resolution in the X-rays, you can see actually the source like kind of like flickering, uh, but it seems to flicker between two very distinct states, which we call the high state and the low state. And sometimes it shows flares. Uh, and the optical does something a bit similar to like not quite as clear cut. So what we think is happening is that there's an accretion disk that's formed and the accretion disk usually kind of like stands just outside the like inner radius. Is it just a bit outside the kind of um, the point where it can accrete so beyond the sort of uh, the, uh, the pressure balance radius and then uh, you have a jet. So VLA observations actually show like a, a, not a, like an image with a jet but it shows that there's X-ray uh, radio emission that's quite flat and sort of similar to jets you see in other systems. And then sometimes, for whatever reason, maybe like extra material pushed in, the disk goes a bit further in, and then you have like a little accretion stream that makes it to the neutron star. And so you get like the high state. So that's the, the rough picture. So what am I making? How, how, what's the mass of the companion? So the companion is something like a point, between 0.2 and 0.3 solar mass. Okay. <clears throat> Very graphic. Very good graphic. Yeah. yeah. Can, we, can we, from the sort of high scale of the accretion high state, do we know how much mass is on these streams? Um, I'm not sure we know exactly, but yeah, it's it's actually like the disk is actually so. If you compare to a typical X-ray binary, um, the, like that's the thing people haven't you know took a while to realize. They were like, oh, it's the you know it's like an X-ray binary, but actually it's more like an X-ray binary in quiet sense. When this one is in a high state, it's like a regular X-ray binary, but like in quiescence. Um, and it seems that there's very mass, little mass period. So actually, right. I was going to show uh, so here. All propeller is, mode type things. Say again? All yeah, yeah, propeller, propeller mode, yeah. yeah. So uh, 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 Amruta, Jodan, and other people have like uh, looked at pulsations in the X-rays because pulsations appeared and uh, you can keep timing the pulsar even though it's disappeared in the radio. And what they find is that basically the pulsar, uh, you know, I'll skip all the details of it, but basically the pulsar is spinning down over time. And it, you would think, you know, if there's an equation, this it should be spun up. Is it going down or up? Is it some color? Or 
Yeah, so it keeps, you know, obviously you cannot like resolve like the propeller from non-propeller because it's too quick, but overall the bulk uh, behavior is that it keeps spinning down. Uh, okay, so the gamma rays. <coughs> Uh, so if you take uh, the gamma ray photons and you fold them, you may find pulsations. So that's like spin phase repeated twice, and that's fine. And you, you, you see, you know, bam. So uh, and each dot is a photon, basically. So yeah, you see you see pulsations, but often you don't see the pulsations. And uh, there's a number of reasons, but basically you tend to get like a photon in the gamma rays from the source, like sort of once a week. Okay, so. Yeah, you can basically give a nickname to each of the photons you have, like from each source. Um, so it's sort of like you know a couple of hundred photons over kind of like ten years. The problem is that you need a really good description of the pulsar spin, spin down, and the orbit to fold it properly for them to line up. And this gets tricky because these red backs and black widows have very messy orbital dynamics. Um, so it appears as if the, 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 the ascending node position or the orbital period, because it, the, the two are interchangeable because it's a circular orbit, it's as if it kind of like precesses one way and then the other way. And um, if you are just to fit the orbit, like on a couple year time scale, you may need something like 15 orbital, like you can describe the orbit just with a, a Taylor, Taylor series. You might need like 15 terms to describe the orbit to fold the photons properly. So it's a real mess. And what we, well, Colin was the one leading uh, the, the work. He, um, we came up with like a, a Gaussian process modeling where we, we track the photons over short um, time scales and uh, we allow basically for the orbital period or the, the sending node to shift, but just in a way that's correlated over time. And so you go from Adding something with lots of derivatives to having a, a Gaussian process. And when you apply that, actually, you get like a much, much neater uh, orbital solution and, and fold. So the problem is that, you know, if you want to do that in a kind of search mode, then you end up like, you know, you need Einstein at home basically to go through the data. So in some cases, to answer your question from earlier, in some cases, yes, the gamma ray, you know, you can tie it up to the Radio. But once you already know a solution, like radio, you can check it easily. Well, yes and no, because, like, for instance, if you do a, find a thing with Mercat, it's not a fixed orbit. Right? The orbit is not fixed. So you might have only two years, but you need to fold 12 I, years. I was missing this. Yeah. <clears throat> Sometimes, actually, we go, we revisit, we re some sources, we found uh, parts archives, you know, dating like almost 10 years ago, and we could actually find a pulsar, not, now that you know roughly the spin period. Right. But yeah, do not always. Do you understand the dynamics that are causing this uh, changes? Yeah. So the uh, that's other work we've done. So the you just said they were circular orbits. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the original idea for for the messiness of the orbit was that what was called the Applegate mechanism, where basically if you have a varying quadrupole in the system, the orbit can change. Um, and what would make a quadrupole change? It would be the companion's quadrupole moment. Um, if the, product, the companion is highly magnetized, um, if there are magnetic cycles, it could change a bit, you know, the structure of the star and cause a change in particle that then would induce precession or less precession, and you could have that. The problem is that the, the idea that it would be driven by the magnetic field, like the, 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 you know, the energy scale doesn't seem to work, so it has to be something else. So are they is it convective or is it too much heat in the outside? Um, so the red backs, they are partly convective, but they still have like a large like radiative so, like inner part. So the fluctuations from the convection aren't enough to do the heat. Mm. Right. And then when you get to the black widows, they're completely convective. Right. Well, well, they're completely convective, that's okay, right? Yeah, yeah. potentially, Maybe. yeah. But yeah, so... The, I mean, that was the old story for the original binary pulsars having non-zero eccentricities. Yeah, fluctuations do the convection. Mm. So I think maybe, um, but it's really messy. Some systems are quite stable, actually, are even used for pulsar timing array. Really? The yeah, backs? yeah uh, black widows, some, okay. uh, yeah. small numbers, but, and I'm, you know, people keep discussing, like, are they reliable or not? But 
uh, but some are just very messy. Um, so we were, uh, my, my former post of Guillaume Voisin and I were discussing like how annoying it was to describe the orbit with like all these derivatives and whatnot. So Guillaume is a theorist and he, he looked at the, the, like doing a post Newtonian expansion for like tides, basically. And he found something very surprising. In fact, um, it appears that even for a system that is so-called circular, there's always a residual eccentricity you cannot get rid of because of the quadrupole moment. And so it, lo it looks quasi-circular, but it's actually not perfectly circular. And because of that, it means that you can have like essentially precession taking place. And, um, and so, uh, but the, the neat thing is that this term, this minimum eccentricity or residual eccentricity, when you look at all the mass and everything, it depends on like this term that we call K2, which is essentially a, some kind of a compactness factor that depends of, like on the exact internal structure of the star. It's a love number for planetary. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, uh, and then like objects like, you know, exo, uh, or like Jupiter or, uh, or stars can have like very different numbers. Um, so we, we, we can actually, so for the 2051, one of the, of the systems, we can measure precession and some small eccentricity, and then we could look at the value of that uh, quadruple basically of the, of the companion. So that eccentricity looks like the, the West Second Pulsar in the, in the bodies that don't have right, that 10 minus 5 sort of two, right? Yeah. 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 But if you don't use our kind of new pyramid timing model, I mean, you're never really going to be able like to extract that. that. Yeah, exactly. yeah. So, but this one is like the kind of like the poster child because yeah, we have like kind of 30 great. year or whatever of data. The other ones, we don't have quite enough to make that such measure measurement yet. Uh, okay, so I know I'm going to run out of time, so I'll just skip over. But yeah, there, there's weird timing anomalies, so we've been looking a bit at that. Uh, the physics of light propagation. So, for instance, Martin's group, you know, published a really neat paper in the past called the like extreme scattering events in in the, the original Black Widow pulsar. Uh, I just want to highlight maybe this result, which was kind of tying the you know to the original paper from Chris Thompson. Um, we had uh, low far observations uh, where we could basically measure uh, like the time series, so like beam form observation, but also because it's an interferometer, we could do imaging at the same time. And if the, the eclipse mechanism was some kind of a scattering phenomenon, basically uh, the pulsar would disappear in the beam form of the observation, but it would still be there in the imaging. And what we found is that basically the pulsar does disappear in the in the image. Uh, but uh, what's so the the uh, I'm sorry the the red sorry, the blue is the pulsed oh, sorry these are two different frequencies and um, and the uh, and the gray the gray is the pulsed flux and the the blue is the imaging flux and what we found is that when you look in details the in some of the observations the, the pulsar uh, comes back earlier in the image than in the in like the time series so there's a transition at some point basically in the eclipse mechanism. So what we think takes place mostly is synchrotron resonance, but then near the edges, the, the plasma properties change, and then you get extreme scattering, but no more resonance. Like your, your plasma frequency, you know, it becomes low enough that the photons should travel, but they get really scattered. Yeah. So the so there might be you know even a new probe, so to speak, uh, to to kind of like study a bit you know the properties of, of the plasma. Oh yeah. So that's the plot of it. I'd forgotten it was on a different one. So that's the beam, the beam form, and that's the imaging. So yeah, so it comes comes back earlier, but not all the time. So it's quite hard. Uh, it's pulsar weather. Yeah, 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 literally. And then when you look at the extent of the orbit, like that's a side view of the system, and that's a top view, and that's like our line of sight, and that's a companion. So you can see that. I mean, the material. I mean, you don't really need like necessarily that to work it out. Like if a system is eclipsing 70% of the time, it means the material has to go like, you know, even there. But uh, so it's quite, it, it, yeah, there's a lot of pulsar weather going on this. Uh, okay, so just want to take, do I have five minutes maybe to just, or if people sure. want to go, I just want to show some of the work I've done in, the, in agriculture. So basically, 
<coughs> One of my colleagues, you might know her, Sarah Bridal, who's well known uh, former cosmologist because now she does food science like full time, uh, got interested in the, the food security problem, you know, going forward. And, um, <coughs> and uh, then with discussions with her and everything, I started wor working on that project. So basically, uh, the problem is that uh, there's, a, there's a weed called Parthenium, uh, it's a little green bush, uh, which grows like aggressively across the world. It's from the Americas originally, but it uh, seems to have as first spread to uh, Australia and then probably through seed banks that other countries buy, you know, to, for their crops. It got over to, for instance, the, uh, the Himalayas, like the, the sort of top part of, uh, of Pakistan and India, and then through the, the water system, basically, like, you know, went down, and now it's all over the Punjab. And uh, it can destroy, if one doesn't keep it at check, uh, in check, it will destroy like 90% of your crops. Uh, it's also a bit like an allergen, so if you touch it, you'll have rashes. Animals also are affected. So uh, if you have cow, for instance, the milk goes sour, so you can, you know, so it's really nice. Uh, now people can like find it and they can like pull it and whatever, but on a, you know, tackling it, you know, because it's a pandemic, more or less, you need a global approach. So we thought, you know, maybe we could try to map it on large scales and then come up, for instance, with like simulations on how it evolves over time and then see, you know, is it better that you target like a specific region than another, or you, you better like, you know, spread your resources all over the place, or, you know, how can you do something? So our first idea was, okay, well, let's see if we can track it over large regions. So typically you, you need like someone in a vehicle driving around and, you know, monitoring it. But we thought, okay, maybe we can do a bit better. So we, we partnered with uh, CABI, which is a, an NGO who works in the agriculture, um, uh, area and we decided okay let's try to see if we could do it from space using remote sensing and the problem is very much like an astronomy problem basically because you know you have you have different bands so these are um you know, that's the spectrum basically of light transmitted to the ground so you have various like big absorption windows which are you know typically water you know areas uh, resonance areas and these are like the location of various bands from different satellite so Sentinel has got 12 different bands, and basically uh, we thought, okay, we could use, you know, the, the spectral signature, basically, of the plant and try to spot it on the ground. But obviously, uh, you know, a, uh, understanding your signal is really key, right? So it's a bit like cosmology, right? Because you have like the, the CMB fluctuations, which are kind of like, you know, mini Kelvins or micro Kelvins on top of a huge background. And then you try to, you know, take it away and that's by understanding your spectrum really well, you can do it. Now, when I started that, I was like, oh, okay, let's get the spectrum of the plant, and you know, that's it. Well, it turns out, like, there's not really good spectra of plants. Uh, so, okay. so we had, to, we, we had to do something else. And obviously, you know, a, a green bush looks a lot like grass and another type of green bush, right? So how do you do this? Well, so you basically, you know, the approach was of you know modern things, right? So we'll use machine learning and AI, uh, but you need a lot of data right, to train your algorithms. So um, so we're like, okay, well we'll do a survey, and uh, and that way that's where Cabby's expertise was really good because they are like you know botanists and and plant biologists and such. So we designed a survey, but a bit like a cosmology survey really, because we we took like a province, we we split it into like you know small grid points. And then we surveyed like randomly, and uh, we did it at multiple times over two years. But some of the, the the survey boxes we moved around to new places, but some we kept so that we could have a lot of like you know balance between a lot of different re areas, but also having like some that we follow. So we got something like four thousand ground measurements. Uh, and the typical like papers you read in the field is like you know some poor PhD student who goes and walks in a local park and will get you know maybe a hundred data points and then they they train an ML thing and then they you know they classify so like way beyond you know what what's been done before and we use like you know these uh, 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 Chrome uh, sort of like uh, tablets you know Android tablets that have a GPS in them so we would like the people would go and they'll just tap. And we had like an open source like a uh, toolkit where they could like uh, tell about 
that what the ground looks like in a specific box with all the ecology that's there. So we have like a lot of ancillary data as well that are useful. So we define a box which is about 20 meters uh, across because the, uh, the, 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 the pixels from Sentinel to the satellite where the data are basically public are about 10 uh, meters across. So you kind of get maybe four of them, but you know, usually they're a bit shifted. So you guarantee that you have at least one full pixel on there. Uh, and then we yeah, basically send people around to the survey and then uh, collected these data points for uh, our machine learning. Also, we thought we could do something with uh, drones. Because when you send someone, right, they, they look at like, they would put little flags, and then they would look and they, they'd be like, is there a partenium or not? Uh, you know, 5% of that box has it, or like they would put some percentage, and they would, they would say some percentage of bare soil and this and that, but it's all a bit arbitrary, if that makes sense. So we thought if we could have a, a drone that would fly over a field with a multiband imager, then we would have like really good quantitative data. And then we could do filter transformation to like transform these filters to the satellite filters. Um, so we built a camera about this big, which can be mounted on a drone. And uh, it's all Raspberry Pi powered. So there's six nano pies in there. And each has a different filter, optical filter. Most of them are like in the red per region where the plant signature is strongest. And um, we've, it's not like it still needs a bit of uh, you know kind of a benchmarking. And but we we got the prototype working. Um, but there are many challenges. So the, this is Elliot Bolgen, actually we almost came for postdoc here, um, <clears throat> flying the drone with a little box. And uh, there's still calibration and everything to do, but uh, all of it is based on open source. Uh, we're trying to finish the paper. Uh, but the advantage uh, of that is, uh, so this is a park near Manchester, but we made a replica, which was in Pakistan, and with the same firmware and everything, so we could troubleshoot you know, what they were doing. Um, so yeah, we have all of our control points, then we ran the ML and the map, that's in red, sorry, the contrast is not so good because it's on a black background, but is the places where we think Partinium is. So overall, we think we can, we can locate it on the ground, but basically it has to be extended enough. You know, the one plant you don't see, but if it, you know, if there's a 20 meter patch, usually when it's there, it just like spreads. So you, you would see it, but uh, if anything, it's the rate of false positive, which is, like on the high side, if that makes sense. But that's not something new for like astronomy, right? When you look for FRBs, for instance, you have a lot of junk and a little bit of what you're interested in. Um, so then uh, the last part, which you know is ongoing work, really is to you know come up with models and everything, and a, a, a final data product which people can, can use. Uh, but there are challenges, like especially with the drone, because you need you have a you know, a sequence of images, then you need to stitch them, right? So we're using astronomical software to do the stitching, but then the, 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 the Raspberry Pi cameras, right? They're just like cheap cameras, they're not professional grade. So then you need to reverse engineer to like disable things like, auto, you know, white balance control and things like that. And then you need to, uh, the image is like, you know, usually there's some kind of like software stuff that will do kind of like a flat field and everything that would make it look pretty for like, you know, using as a security camera, but if you want to do science with it, then you need to do like really good calibration, like flat fields and stuff. But yeah, it's the sort of stuff that we do as astronomers. So it's quite a, a cute project, uh, but still very much in, in the making. But uh, yeah, uh, I thought, you know, it was something fun to do as a, you know, as an astronomer to, you know, sometimes we wonder why we do what we do. And obviously uh, fundamental research is really important, but sometimes doing something that might be useful, like immediately to humans, is is also uh, is also a good feeling. So uh, yeah, anyway, that's it. Thanks very much, Rene. Next slide. Can you get more? Yeah, I want to go back to this question of the. Blackboard of pulsar mass measurements. Yeah. And you know, you mentioned that they're potentially subject to be systematic errors because you have to do something involving the spectra, uh, you know, some modeling there. And so I know that there have been you know, many claims of large pulsar masses coming from 
widows, for instance, there's this well nine pulsar, 2.35 solar masses. And I wanted to get your take. So do you believe that and uh, as a mass measurement? And you know, what would you consider the heaviest reliably measured pulsar mass? Yeah, so <laughs> um, the Romani one, uh, 1311, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was like up to three solar masses or something. So, well, uh, it no longer is, by the way, it's like 1.85 something. Um, it, well, and it's not Roger's fault, but the, you know, the problem a lot in all fields of like research is that you pull out, you, you know, you publish a paper about something and very exciting. Which for all the checks you you know even the best most perfectly intentioned person you know believes right they've done all the checks and then something else comes up after a new data or something and then you revise and you know it turns out it was not right but then on doing that right a lot of people from outside that sort of field for instance would be like oh three solar mass neutrons are really really exciting but then when there's sort of not the retraction but you know the follow up work that says oh no it's actually not the case comes out. A lot of people were like, we're not here because it's not like really exciting. So it's happened basically. Um, so at the moment, um, I think among the spiders, the heaviest one, I believe, is this one, 2215 plus 5135. And it's probably somewhere above two solar mass. But the, the, the mass that's quoted in the paper is 2.35, I think, with like sort of 0.2. Right. Uh, solar mass uncertainty, but I mean, no disrespect to actually, I know them well, Manu and, and, and Tariq. Uh, they've done their best and everything, but they had to use composite spectra and blah and, and everything. And I, th I think that the amount of systematics still in there is quite large. So I'm not, sh you know, I, I, I would not sort of put my house on where it is there. But with the new progress we've made with the modeling, at least we, I think we can get like the the velocity measurement from the spectral line reliably. What's most difficult, which is the reason why, like the, in that paper where I showed like the, the trail spectra here, we before starting the work, we thought we would get like 0.05 solar mass uncertainties. And the reason why it never keeps going down is because um, it's, you, it's really difficult to constrain the, the, the temperature distribution on the surface of the companion, because you see it exposed at different phase. So you kind of like have a convolution, right? And essentially you like the integrated light of a half star, which rotates. So you kind of end up in a way, if you could deconvolve, you would get kind of like a temperature value for different slices. But for instance, you never know anything about how like the temperature might vary from pole to pole. Um, and then uh, you, you don't resolve either on the surface. So the, you know, could one come up like our typical model for like a, the simplest like light curve is just illumination from like a wind or whatever that's like isotropic from the pulsar and you get kind of like a half hemisphere that's illuminated. But, and then it follows, you know, from the, the distance and blah, blah, blah. But could that be wrong? And instead it, it's more like say banded at the equator for some reason, maybe, right? And maybe you, you could reproduce a very similar looking light curve. So, the problem is, is in there that, you know, you can never really, really tell for sure. And it turns out that almost all of these systems show some asymmetry in the light curve. You know, you would think when you see one side and then the other side compared to, you know, the, the conjunctions, it should look the same. But it turns out that in some cases you have like, you know, kind of like a 0.1 or 0.2 magnitude difference, like shoulders, as we call. And uh, we don't know why. It could be that the heat, you know, is circulating around like a bit like in exoplanets where you might derive like a strong jet or like, you know, current like of, of a turbine or, you know, a vect temperature basically around. Uh, it could be that the illumination in the first place is, uh, is beamed, say, because the, the radiation is caused say, by charged particles and it follows field lines or something. Uh, and again, Sometimes in these asymmetric light curves, uh, we usually manage to model it, but sometimes more than two different models can fit it, or sometimes a model fit it, and then you take an, the next, uh, you know, the other model doesn't. Then you take another source, and then one model fits, but not the other. So maybe there, obviously, there could be many reasons, 
but you would like you know some kind of unifying model and yeah and from first principles it's very difficult right you would need to simulate that irradiated star in 3d blah 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 and yeah so that's why i think we can make mass measurements but they they you know they never go down as much as you would want it and the problem is that like you know getting bloody good data makes your life super difficult because when you have like you know 0.1 mag error bars you can just basically fit out almost anything and it's nice but 1957 we had pretty good data but then we got like gtc data you know 10 meter telescope data and five different bands and now you see like these little thing and they're, they're kind of real then you're like pulling your hair because it's it's like Ugh. so there's a lot of very interesting physics but it makes your life you know unbearable I think on the most, the, so I would say the secure one is not the black widows. Yes, indeed. Right. So I'm interested in multi-probe inferences of the equation of state, and historically we have not treated the black widow measurements on the same footing as the shear. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Safe. Yeah. So yeah, I think you know what's clear is that the black widows and redbacks are more massive than the neutrons, the ones in neutron star system. Like for the, it doesn't mean that you know there cannot be one that's lower mass and one higher mass, but the like. The mass measurement, like uh, for the population on average, sure. you know, is is higher mass. But the black widows and redbacks have different distributions of masses. I, I think it's still a bit too difficult. But also, I'm not sure. Do you have a good handle on your selection effects? So when you're talking about distributions, are you sure that you know based on your work? Well, certainly in terms of like whether we find a black widow of certain you know of a certain mass or another one. Uh, or red back. I don't think there's a selection effect on the mass of the neutron star or of the companion. Um, but but, no, at least. No, yeah. I mean, for you know, at least you know, there's nothing I can think physically why we would see pulsations more easily or something from you know a more massive or less massive one. Uh, red backs tend to be a, like the population is dominated. I think, if I recall, by red backs at the moment, uh, or at least. The optical studies, you know, there's a lot more about redbacks because they're brighter, and also, um, they, well, although at the same time the black widows, the, the pulsar is less accelerated because it's less massive, right? So the pulsar is less accelerated. So the, it's all these trade-offs. So in terms of, you know, the numbers we have and everything, I don't think the population, I mean, it's heavily biased, but the masses we measure, I'm not sure, but, you know, they're probably a bit of a random sample. We should leave it at this. Thank you very much, Rene.